The Highland Targe. Variants of these small shields were used in the Highlands of Scotland for centuries and they were a favoured weapon among Highland warriors alike. In this video I'm going to look at its history, how it was made and how it was used in both single and battlefield combat in the 17th and 18th century. So stay tuned. Hi folks, Tom from Van Dabby Dozy. Thanks for tuning in. So this video is actually a collaboration with Heiko from the Catherine Society. He's going to be running through the Marshall application and Graham from Alba Targes who actually handmade me this gorgeous targe. So he's going to be taking us through the making process behind this awesome weapon. So for those who have been following my Highlander series for a while, you know I mainly look at this area of history in the context of wilderness survival skills. That's my main area of interest, my main area of expertise. But of course, everything is connected and you have to, you know, draw in other aspects of history and culture to put everything in context. And uh, the Highland martial culture ties in with the wilderness survival perspective. During that time, people, people who were traveling into the wild away from the homestead, if they weren't cattle drovers or, you know, travelers or tradesmen, then there were warriors on uh, castle raiding or battle campaigns. So first a simplified historical background. So for centuries the Highlands had a very strong warrior culture and the clan chiefs and lairds often had a number of specialist warriors, often made up from the clan gentry. Um, and the average man of the peasantry class, although not a specialist warrior, it was in the culture for every man to be trained in the martial basics. So this meant that a clan could very quickly summon an army and the, the peasantry sort of men were led by the specialized warriors. So this is where we get the word Catarin from, from the Gallic Cahernia, which was a collective term for peasantry, but then came to mean a band of fighting men. So cattle was the main form of economy in the Highlands and a big part of the warrior culture as well as a sort of masculine initiation uh, was cattle raiding. So basically sneak into your rival's land in the cover of darkness, try round up as many of their cattle as you can and herd them back to your land, hopefully without being discovered. So this was often done in the autumn time when the harvest was in and bright moonlit nights are more common uh, during that time of the year. Now if and when you were discovered by your rivals and if you couldn't sort out some sort of deal or negotiation then often it was settled with violence and that could be anywhere between just the best warriors from either side having a duel or a full-on clan skirmish. Now, I highly recommend the book School of the Moon which is a collection of stories based on true events uh, about this cattle raiding warrior culture. Um, I think the paperback is pretty hard to find and expensive, but there's a Kindle version that's quite cheap, so I'll put a link below to that. Hopefully that has some context for you. So let's go on to the main topic of the video, the targe. So the word targe, sometimes pronounced targe, uh, comes from an old Franconian word targa, which means shield. Also similar to a Proto-Germanic word targo. The Gallic is taragage, and these words are apparently the origins of the English word target, as in an object to be aimed at. So these words generally refer to a shield 18 to 21 inches in diameter that is strapped to your arm with a double strap. So different to a buckler, which is a small shield with just a central handle in the middle. So the targe was a common infantry weapon in the Highlands, maybe going as far back as the Middle Ages, but it was certainly very common in the 17th and 18th century. So if you want an in-depth video on how the design changed over the centuries, then go check out Paul's video from Stukata. He's got a very in-depth video on the, the history of the targe and the change in design. So in the context of this video, I'm just looking at 17th and 18th century. And during this time period, the targe had evolved to deal with the increased use of black powder firearms on the battlefield. Um, so they were becoming thicker, heavier, more reinforced, more heavily studded in an effort to, to stop musket balls. But of course, as they were getting thicker, they were getting heavier, so they had to become smaller so that you know you could still actually pick it up and wield it in the battle. And you'll see some reproductions fitted with a long leather strap so you can fling it over your back and carry it. Um, and although there's no surviving historical examples of that, it makes sense to have a strap so that you can carry this uh, over your back when you're walking. So as is often the case, the, the surviving examples that we see in museums were often owned by wealthier people. They were often very, very ornate with you know complex stud designs, sometimes with a removable spike in the boss, but you know potentially a more common man's targe was made a bit more 
simpler. So this particular targe is made in the traditional way, quite an interesting way to make it as strong as possible. So here is the man who made it, Graeme from Alba Targes, who's going to be taking us through the making process. Stay tuned. We have an example made by myself of a typical Highland targe. This type in particular carried by the likes of the nobility, your clan chiefs and your officers of the clans. So typically a Highland shield would have been covered with some kind of animal leather hide, such as cow hide or deer hide. This example I'm holding here today is covered in a cow hide. So about three to three and a half millimetres in thickness. This allowed the craft the craftsman to carve in various decoration onto the leather hide directly. Traditionally the craftsman probably would have used maybe a piece of deer antler to carve in these intricate designs. Also, particular to this shield, is a centre boss made of brass with four smaller bosses on the outer perimeter. The bosses not only served as protection for the shield but also for ornamentation as well. Now this targe here has a very special feature. It's hidden behind the targe in a leather pouch. As you can see here, on the back of the targe. Now this is quite unusual actually, in that it's more of a blade than a spike. But by screwing this into the centre of the boss, you could create a formidable weapon as well as a form of defence. Not only could you inflict some serious injury on your attacker with this, but could also catch sword blades or other pulled weapons. So as you can see here, there's a covering of animal hide here. This particular example is goat hide. Um, the kind of hides you would have used in the day would have been goat hide, deer hide, possibly even boar hide. This is tacked down at the back. In the centre here we have an arm pad, which is formed using straw, which is placed underneath the hide. On each side of the arm pad we have two leather strips which are tacked down to keep it in place. So the arm pad also provides um, cushioning for the arm against blows on the front of the targe. Here we have the leather arm strap which is fixed to two metal brackets on this side. And here we have a handle, a leather handle, we can grip on, secure grip. This is formed by, this particular example has a, a brass rod place through the handle so that it can pivot. This may allow more versatility, say holding a duck. Okay, so we have another example of a Highland Targe here. This one's slightly bigger than the other example. This is a 21 inch in diameter. Again, highly ornamented. Slightly less studs on the other Targe, however, still very striking in its design. This Targe is actually a replica of the Targe that was carried by Ian Kerr, who was the 22nd Chief of the Clan McDougall, and carried that in the 1700s. So again, Prime example of a targe being carried by a chief or an officer. So taking a closer look here at the ornamentation on the front of this targe, you can see the various kind of designs and symbols that are embossed or tooled into the face of the targe. In Celtic knotwork, and in between we have some foliage style network, uh, patterns here, triquetras, and quite strikingly around the outside we have a number of different animals that would have been commonly found in the Scottish Highlands. But at its core, is a wooden core which was typically formed from two layers of plank wood which were set at right angles to each other. This provided a strong core for the targe, typically made of wood such as oak or pine. Oak being a bit heavier but more resistant to heavier blows, pine a lighter wood, perhaps more uh, susceptible to fracturing. However, the way the construction of the core is made, through the planks being glued together at right angles and also pegged, formed a very rigid, strong structure and of course being held together by the leather of the face of the targe had a very robust shield overall. Again, very similar to the other targe we looked at, we have a covering of goat hide. We have a leather arm strap here. The difference with this one is it's fixed with metal studs on either side. We have the arm pad here. We have the handle, which again is leather, which is wet, wet moulded or wet formed over a piece of rope. And then it's sewed along the underside here nailed on either side, provides a very strong and rigid handle. And again, you can see the leather turned over from the face of the targe and tacked down at the back. Provides a very strong, rigid targe. So that's us hopefully covered the basics of the construction of the Scottish targe. Hope you've learned something today. We're now off to do battle with our fiercest enemy, the Scottish Midge. Back to you, Tom. So now we know how it was made, how was it actually used in combat? Well, let's discuss in the battlefield first. So in the 17th and 18th century, the targe was most commonly used with the basket-hilted broadsword. 
So this was a common weapon in Europe as well, but it became a favourite among the Highlanders, especially the Highland gentry. It's basically a slashing and cutting weapon with a pretty convincing tip as well, with a protective metal basket around the hand. But in terms of other weapons used, there is earlier accounts of people using small hand axes with the targe. It's also commonly reported and depicted in old illustrations of Highland warriors holding their dirk in the same hand as their targe. So this meant that you could use this as a secondary weapon, just like the famous stories of how the Jacobites broke through some of the red coat bayonet lines by first parrying the bayonet with the targe, following through with the dirk before finalizing with a cut from the broadsword. This also meant if you happened to lose your sword in battle, then your dirk was close to hand to use in an emergency. Now in a battlefield context, the targe wasn't designed to be a formation shield. So it wasn't designed to be in a big long line of overlapping shields, you know, typical to how the Vikings might have fought. It's a bit too small for that. But descriptions of past battles do say that people armed with broadswords and targes were situated in the front rank. So, you know, that makes sense. You're providing protection from the rest of your men from enemy projectiles. But then it's also worth considering that the gentry of the clan probably would have had the best targes and it was generally the honourable thing for them to be in the front rank anyway. Now the Highlanders were famous for a tactic called the Highland Charge, which simply put is basically trying to surprise your enemy and charge at them as a body of men coming from the higher ground. Now, old battlefield stories describe that as you were charging down the hill, when you saw your enemy raise their muskets for a volley, then the front rank would kneel and slightly tilt their targe with the idea of deflecting any enemy musket rounds. The rank behind you would then return musket fire before you'd get back to your feet and charge the final bound, basically. So what about fighting with the targe in a one-to-one -one context? Well, the main historical manuals that we have are Donald McBain in 1728, Thomas Page, 1746, and the Pennycook drawings of 1746. And from those, we can draw three basic rules for fighting with the targe. One, hold it correctly. Don't exhaust yourself. So the targe was typically held with the edge facing your opponent like so, but because it's quite heavy, you've got to be careful not to tire yourself out. Now there is some moves where you extend your targe with your sword arm, but generally in order to save energy, then you're rolling the targe into different guards using your shoulder, which is a stronger muscle with the idea that you're gonna get tired less quickly. Two, don't blind yourself. Now in Donald McBain's book, he specifically says that if you're not experienced fighting with the targe, then never use one in a duel, because what tended to happen was that someone would faint to the head, you would panic, completely blind yourself, leaving your body open and you have no idea who your opponent is. Three, cover the line of attack. Now in movies, when you see people fighting with swords and shields, you tend to see them doing these big movements, one after another, sword, ah, being like that. And it might look epic, but you're going to get exhausted really, really quickly. And you're also exposing your arms as you're doing that. So rather than keeping your shield close to you and doing these moves like that, you know, every time I do that, then my entire forearm is open to be attacked. So what's typically taught in these old manuals is to extend your charge along with your sword arm so that I'm protecting the forearm uh, of my sword hand and also with the right angle, I'm also protecting my head from counter-attack. Those are the absolute billy basics, but here's Heiko showing some examples of him sparring with the broadsword and targe. Check it out.
So Heiko has a full series of lessons on the broadsword and targe, all the way from the basics right up to experimental sparring with other weapons. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, definitely go subscribe to his channel. So there's a background in the Highland Targe for you. What I'm thinking of exploring next is tying this back into the wilderness survival aspect. So experimenting, carrying and traveling uh, with the weapons alongside my sleeping system and my survival kit. Um, but due to the weight of the weapons, I'm probably going to have to simplify my survival kit even more, which uh, should be interesting. A huge thanks to Heiko from the Catherine Society for sharing all your knowledge and expertise on the martial side, and huge thanks to Graham from Alba Targes for making me this absolutely amazing targe. Definitely go check out his shop, I'll put a link below. He also made me this beautiful sword baldric with this uh, Celtic knot design, and he also lent me his sword for this video, so cheers Graham for that. I'm hopefully gonna pick one up for myself soon. So thanks so much for watching folks. Huge thanks to all my patrons and supporters, all the people who have sent me nice messages of support. I really, really appreciate it. Can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And uh, hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Cheers, have a good day.